Uh, my family and I, we moved here uh, a little over eight years ago, and um, we, we moved into the neighborhood of Easter Lake. And uh, right after we moved in, they started doing construction, uh, you know, just past north of uh, Army Post Road there. And uh, for the good, you know, on and off last eight years, they've been continuing to do construction over here. Pastor Andy, when I was first hired, told me, like, yeah, someday they're coming to in front of us here to do construction. And for years, I didn't really believe it. Because they always said, like, someday, someday that'll happen. And finally, they, they got over there, right, for a long, long time. And now they're here. And uh, construction can, can take a while sometimes. There's usually a, a plan, a, a vision behind it. My wife and I, we grew up in Chicago suburbs and went to a school kind of in uh, Indiana, the, the kind of northwest part of Indiana. So we drive back and forth in that little stretch between Illinois and Indiana. And I think I think Chicago and Illinois, if you were traveled there, they just, they love construction. I mean, they would never stop the four years we were there. There was always, always construction. I know somebody had some sort of plan and vision, but it was just always on going. Now, when a plan, a vision for something finally comes together, it's it's pretty beautiful, right? When this is all done and widened, it'll be great, hopefully. We can trust in that. Uh, next week, we're, we're going to start a, a new sermon series kind of for the fall that'll kick some bigger things off for us. In fact, next week, I've got something really exciting to tell you guys about uh, in terms of our, our children's and kids' ministry, so, so come back for that. But today, I wanted to kind of do something similar, this kind of plan, vision casting, looking out the future idea. As we kind of come into the fall, kind of kids are back in school, I like doing this, this uh, around this time to kind of just come back to who are we and where are we going? Kind of just this rally of, um, you know, we are Lighthouse Community Church and where's God taking us next? Maybe you've been around for years, maybe you're newer in the last year or so, but it's always good to kind of come back to our roots and just say, uh, this is who we are, and this is where we are going. Last fall, when I came back from a sabbatical, and the first year I did was this kind of dream, big dream, bigger idea for our church and our community, kind of just vision casting for where we are going. So something kind of similar today, who we are, kind of where we are going. Now, I, I could talk about our, our values, that we value these, these six things we've kind of pegged and talked about over the years that we value the gospel, the centrality of the gospel in everything we do, from my preaching to the songs we sing to the elders we pick, that the gospel is central. We will talk about the gospel today. We talked about it on Wednesday with our children's ministry. It is something we value. We value the Bible also. We value teaching this. I will open this up and teach from this regularly on a Sunday with our children's ministry, high school, women's, men's ministry. We also value an openness to the Spirit. As we just sung here a minute ago, we want the Spirit to be here. I had a laugh kind of that song. I talked about, you know, uh, here in this room. We are not really in the room right now. But, uh, we value the Spirit being here with us. But also this horizontal value thing, we value local and global missions. We want to go far to Uganda and Honduras. We want to do missions across the street in your neighborhoods and schools. We value family discipleship, having dads and moms and parents come around our kids deep friendships. I could talk this morning about kind of our discipleship pathway as we kick some things off for the fall, like our one-to-one -one discipleship that some of you are uh, going to be a part of, and or just this idea of kind of, 
hey, worship God, um, find a community, grow intentionally, and serve others. A lot of our programs fall in those areas. Or I could talk about kind of our leadership and things that we preached on over the years. But where I want to take us this morning is simple and, and basic, and that's just our mission, who we are. What, what do we do? Our purpose here as a church, today, tomorrow, this next year, who we are. Our mission statement that you'll see when you enter our sanctuary up on the wall, when you leave our building, it's in your bulletin, it's on our website, is this, to help all peoples see the light of Christ and be the light of the world. Help all people see the light of Christ and be the light of the world. There are so many good, awesome, Christ-centered churches in this area. I live down the street from the pastor at Living Waters. There's Soteria and Valley and Hope and Carlisle Church. There's so many that we are Lighthouse Community Church. We have a lighthouse over there. We have a lighthouse inside. We wanted to dive into this idea that we are a, a house of light. Light comes from us. We are to be the light in some way. And this morning, I want to get super practical for what that means. Today, tomorrow, this next week, this next year, what does it really mean to have us be in Lighthouse Community Church, to have that mission, help we get fired up for being the light of the world in this culture we find ourselves in. So why these words? Why this order help all peoples see the light of Christ, be the light of the world? Just going to break this down in three parts today. First part, help all peoples. Now I'm doing the main teaching with our Club 412 on Wednesday nights, and this new curriculum we have it has a lot of kind of uh, repeating back and forth, kind of call and response to it, so the kids can answer back out. So I'm going to try this with you guys today. So uh, repeat after me. Help all peoples. Great. I know that sounds a little strange. Peoples. Uh, why not everyone? Uh, or even just uh, most people. Some people. Why, why peoples? All peoples. This word peoples, the more I say the word just sounds strange. The word peoples, it, it comes up in the Bible referring to um, many, it's, it's this plural of, of groups of people, of nations or, or nationalities. It's this kind of all-encompassing, all people groups, everyone. There's this vision that's talked about from Old Testament to New Testament that comes about especially in Revelation about this. As God in the Old Testament uh, picked a, a, a family to bless and to bless all through Abraham and then the Jews, um, it then became apparent that it wasn't just for the Jews and that family, but it was then for the Gentiles and all peoples. The book of Revelation then has this phrase repeated over and over and over again. Uh, Revelation chapter 5. As John is lost in the, the beauty and grandeur of heaven and different angels and people singing, it says this, chapter 5, verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal. They're, they're singing to Jesus. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. 
and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Every tribe and language and people and nation. This gets repeated then all throughout Revelation. Revelation chapter 7, this kind of vision of the end of what is to come. Revelation 7 verse 9. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All peoples, all nations, all tribes. I mean, it just it keeps going in chapter 10, and chapter 13, and chapter 14, and chapter 17. It keeps repeating this. Peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Our denomination, the EFCA, created this whole organization called the All People Initiative. You can go Google that, EFCA, All People Initiative. It's this national coalition of multi-ethnic and multicultural leaders committed to disciple-making, gospel impact, and community transformation. I think I've said this before, but when I first was thinking of coming to Iowa, we moved from Missouri, and we were praying and imagining what Iowa would be like, and I, I didn't know much about Des Moines or Iowa, but I just kind of pictured cornfields and cows, and that was about it. I, I have been surprised over the years by the amount of diversity that is in Des Moines and Southside and Carlisle and Iowa. I, I love I love going to other countries and doing mission trips. We, we've got some praying and planning in mind that we'll be going to Uganda this next uh, 2024. But I find that the nations are here also. Just this last week, um, because of all the construction over here, I will now kind of drive through these neighborhoods to get here. And as I do, I like to uh, put on my Spotify music when I get in the car. Adrian just told me recently that it's one of my toxic traits. I've never heard that before. But I have to play my certain music and song when I get in the car. And so I, this, this one early morning, come to church, I, I've been into like indie, bluegrass, folk kind of music. And I had this, this band, the Arcadian Wild, on. I'm blasting my bluegrass music, and I come into these neighborhoods, and all the kids are out for the bus. And I was surprised the amount of Hispanic, Black, African American, Asian. I listened to my bluegrass music, cranked up. I felt very white. <laughs> there is a diversity here that I, I love, and I want to have here at Lighthouse to invite in and be a part of our church because someday in heaven, that's what it'll be like. All peoples, tribes, languages, nations. We have that here on the south side. I, you know, it's funny, I look back just in God's kindness and vision that he has. Uh, almost a year ago, August 28th, 2022, when I was preaching on kind of dreaming bigger, about our church, I, I made this statement that, you know, what if someday we have a Spanish or Nepalese church meeting here at Lighthouse? And through his providence and working, we now have a Nepalese church that meets here. And there are people, people groups here through that church that we would never reach because of language barriers or cultural barriers, but they are being reached for Christ right here. We've seen it through PBS or Wednesday night or kids ministry. It's not just different culture or nations that talk about peoples, but it's ages too. From the younger to the older to thinking of marriages or families, we want to help all peoples here. We, we kind of have really focused a lot of our outreach on 
on younger families with trunk or treat coming up. Uh, we just did VBS with lots and lots of kids from our neighborhood or Christmas or Easter egg hunt. But we also have a large population here. We call it the Platinum Club, right? Where we reach out to our older generation. I, I looked up the word platinum. It means rare, valuable. It's even more valuable than gold sometimes. So we, we appreciate you that are in the Platinum Club, our older folks here. But really just practically for a minute, what does it mean for us, for you, to be this all people's, help all people's ages, cultures type of, of thing? You know, I got invited recently to um, go over to Studebaker Elementary School uh, to pray in front of the school with some teachers for their school. Simple thing like that. Going to schools before they started, praying for our kids, praying for people around us. Maybe it is doing more outreach across the street or uh, in your, your own neighborhood. You know, maybe, maybe you pick a Sunday where you just stay a little longer at church and just come and worship with our, our Nepalese brothers and sisters. Their worship is exciting and different, and there's flags and dancing, and they are passionate about Jesus. And then we plan some things together. We, sh we share some food together. Uh, we pray and worship with our uh, Nepalese brothers and sisters. Or maybe you just commit, you pray for our kids. We have so many kids here, so much potential for ministry um, in our communities. Like when, I, when I see the kids at the bus stop or picking my kids up at school, I, praying for them. Maybe it's you helping out in our kids' ministry. Or, you know, we've realized this recently, too, we have five elders, including myself, and as our population here grows, and we, we have, as I said, a large platinum club here, we need more help to shepherd the flock writing cards or praying for people that are in the hospital or can't be here on a Sunday morning because of injuries or sickness or whatever it is, you can help. So one, this idea of helping all peoples, but two, to help them see the light of Christ. We are a lighthouse, as I said. We are this house of, of light. And uh, what does Lighthouse do? It produces light. So, repeat after me. See the light of Christ. See the light of Christ. In a couple hours, if we were just to sit out here, we would all feel the power of light, right? We're in this strange time where it's, you know, like 30 degrees at nighttime and 95 degrees during the day, you know? Windows open at night, AC on in the day. We, we, we're going to feel the power of light and heat and the sun. You know, if you get like a, a magnifying glass and you magnify that light, you could see that thing power and burning and doing some damage, illuminating. I found this great article uh, from John Bloom, Desiring God. Oh, there. Uh, he says this, uh, we think we know what light is until we're forced to define it. In fact, you might be able to define it something like uh, natural light on Earth is the electromagnetic radiance of the sun. But beyond that, most of us would start stumbling about. The, the deeper science has delved into the nature of light, the more complexity we've discovered. There's far more to light than meets the eye. And as you read through scripture, from beginning to end, you find light being talked about. That physical, real light that we see now talked about, but also just this metaphorical imagery sense. He continues that article from John Bloom. He says, um, the same is true of divine light. The Bible describes it as the very radiance of God's glory. If we're asked to define this divine light, we might be able to manage something like the light of God's glory. 
is the radiance of the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfections. But again, beyond that, most of us would be hard-pressed to give an articulate answer. There's far more to God's light than meets the spiritual eye. But we know what light essentially does for us, both natural and divine. In the very beginning, Genesis, the very first thing that God says, Genesis 1, verse 3, God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called it night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And then to the very end of the Bible, Revelation 22, sometimes to help me to pray or to focus myself on God's greatness or to confess sometimes. The Psalms over and over again talk about light in this way. Psalm 36 verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life, God. In your light do we see light. Psalm 56, 13. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling that I may walk before God in the light of life. For Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And then it begins to focus this imagery in Isaiah especially and John and 1 John on Jesus being our light, our way, our path. This is from Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And John, as he opens up his whole gospel, begins with, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I want Jesus. The light shines darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming in to the world. And Jesus later picks up on this and he says in John 12, I have come into the world as a light. Jesus is a light for us. We want to encourage people, you, me, everyone here, to see the, the light of Christ. And 2 Corinthians 4 really puts those things in the light in Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan doesn't want us to know Jesus, to see Jesus, to see the gospel, understand it. He's blinded our, our hearts and minds and eyes. Verse 5, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, right over Genesis chapter 1, he has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Without God, we could never know Jesus because Satan doesn't want us to know Jesus because we are so sinful and the world is corrupt that God opens our eyes, lets light shine in us to understand the gospel message. So again, really practically, what does this mean for you? 
for me to see the light of Christ? It's a great phrase. What does that actually mean? Well, first and foremost, my hope, my prayer for you is that you, you've experienced that. You've experienced that light of Jesus in your own life. When Paul rode to Damascus, he has this bright light shine on him and blinds him as he meets Jesus for the first time. Something similar to that is what I'm talking about, that Jesus has shown into your life to reveal things that, that you've tried that, that, that don't make sense. You've put your life into or other gods or philosophies that don't make sense. That Jesus would open your heart, your eyes to see him as the one true only way. And then when he does that, that you would fall on your face and say, God, I need you. I repent of all those dark things that I've done before and come to know him. But if you've been a Christian for a long time, you know that it doesn't just stop at the beginning of your faith journey, but it's continual every day, almost every week, continuing to see the light of Christ and know and understand more and more of who Jesus is. And then as he shines in your own life to see how sinful you are and how much you don't actually know about God. I've had two experiences lately just to prove this to me of how much I still need to grow and learn about God. I've been doing a, a book club early on Tuesday mornings at 6 a.m. getting up, and we're reading this, this book called The Holiness of God. So we're talking about over and over again in Scripture about how God is holy, weird and holy. Just this morning as the kids are doing their lesson, they're going to talk about Moses meeting God for the first time, him taking his sandals off his holy ground. But just learning deeper and deeper about God's holiness and what that means, his perfection and glory and difference from us, it just, it's, it's been good. It's been good for me to learn more, understand more of that. Or uh, I've been studying the book of Ephesians lately with my friend Kyle Castro. We just walk through a section each week, underlined circle. teaching kids. I've been teaching kids on Wednesday. My own kids. <laughs> I'm going to pick on Kyle, actually. Kyle, he's been helping out on Wednesday nights this last week, and uh, my son James came home, and he thinks he's now best friend with Kyle Castro. this last thing, number three, be the light of the world. We help all peoples see the light of Christ and be the light of the world. So repeat after me, be the light of the world. more my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. Here's the important parts for you guys today. In the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We get this view today of the world. <laughs> we can look out and see construction. <laughs> we can see Romain, neighborhoods. Paul tells us here in this verse that it is crooked and twisted. I mean, just looking out there, doesn't look very crooked or twisted, right? Romain, neighborhoods. We aren't supposed to be so different that compared to anything else out there, we shine bright as stars or the sun 
compared to anything else, to be different. This is what Jesus picks up on, and he says then to us also, as he's giving the Sermon on the Mount, this big uh, dialogue, this, this message that he gives in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, you, you are the salt of the earth. He says also, you are the light of the world. Now, just back to that salt idea, the salt of the earth. He says, you know, if, if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good. It's said to be thrown away. We, we've been eating a lot of tomatoes lately. Who are my tomato hater, haters in here? Uh, tomato lovers? Yeah, it's usually one of those, like, just either hate or love, but... We need a lot of dill teas, tomatoes, but tomatoes are best, I think, with salt. Lowry's seasoning salt. My dad, he loves Lowry's. Like he would, he would carry like a gun holster if he could, like just to get ready. But tomatoes, salt, salt. It adds something to make it different, right? He's saying that it's it's useless if it's not salty. But also, you, you, you are the light of the world, right? says, you know, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor will people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. Gives light to all in the house. In the same way you let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Be different. Show your light of Christ, of who you believe in and trust in to others around you. Your good works how much you love each other, how much you love Jesus. Show that at your workplace, at your school, in your neighborhoods, so that they may give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This idea of just being the light of the world, it's talked about all sorts of New Testament, of just changing who we are, changing our being. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it says we're called children of light. Children of the day. Or in 1 John 1 and 2, it talks about, okay, if you are truly children of light, then you should love one another. If you hate your brother or sister, you're not walking in the light. So a very practical outcropping of being the light is to love one another. Hatred is darkness, he said. It's opposite. It's... It's not abiding in Jesus. And I was just struck even recently as I was reading Ephesians by friend Kyle. Ephesians chapter 5. He goes to this long list of things not to do. He says sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named. No uh, filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking. No getting drunk. And all this he says in Ephesians 5. He says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So again, very practical. What does this mean for you today, this next week, to be the light? Watch your walk. Watch your actions, your, your words, what you do. Maybe it is about drinking. Maybe it is about your language. Maybe it is about your sexual morality. Ask God to shine that light in your own heart and actions and things and say, God, where, where am I not glorifying you in my life? I'll show you. Stop doing those dark things light in your community, your school, your neighborhood, your your friends around you. Know who you are. You are a believer in Jesus. You are children of the light of the day. Back when we were in COVID time, we did a lot of uh, announcements through my children. We would do video announcements where I would have them do a news broadcast called it Warner Action News Now. And I had them at the end of every news session say,
say this little quick version of our mission statement. And they're a little like kid voices, they would say, see the light, be the light. And I want to leave you with that. As you think about that this next week, to see the light, be the light. To see Jesus, to know him, know him deeper and deeper, understand who he is and his love for you. And to go out and be the light this next week in your communities. And our potluck here afterwards at the school in your neighborhoods. And hey, if you're new, I invite you to come and join us to be a part of that. To come and see this uh, amazing, uh, blinding beauty of Jesus shining in your own hearts. And to go and to be changed. So let's pray and sing one last song together. Father, we do praise you that you have created light out of darkness. You've shown that light into our hearts with the gospel, the good news of Jesus. You've made us aware of it. You, you, you readily tell us about it in the Bible. And so, God, we once again just give our lives to you. And we know that there's still sin and darkness in us in our language, in our thoughts, in our actions. And God, we just ask you to continue to shine that light into our hearts and to say no to sin and yes to you. And that God, we can be a church that is in our communities, our schools, our neighborhoods, our families, that is being the light. And that others might see that and glorify you. Father, we glorify you and worship you now for your goodness. Pray all this in Jesus' name.